Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the crime of war in Palestine with Rayed Jarrar, who is advocacy director of Dawn, the organization founded by slain writer Jamal Khashoggi and found at Dawn, D-A-W-N, Mena, M-E-N-A, dot org. Uh, Raya Jarar, longtime peace activist with many organizations. That's just his current uh, place of doing wonderful activism. Raya, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. Good seeing you again. Good to see you. Um, what is happening now in Gaza and how do developments in the United States impact what might happen? Um, it's a very bad situation. Uh, I don't know if we have words to describe what's going on in Gaza. And uh, honestly, I, I never imagined seeing what we're seeing now in my lifetime. Uh, there are horror stories that my grandparents told me uh, when they went through Nakba in 1947 and 1948 and were displaced internally in Palestine. Um, you know, horror stories that my grandpa told me about him growing up in Palestine, dealing with starvation, uh, you know, attacks, indiscriminate bombings. Uh, we are seeing all of these things live on TV and social media in 2024. Um, it's, uh, it's really uh, un unbelievable. Uh, I have to speak with uh, people in Gaza every now and then uh, for work. Um, and uh, I mean, it's 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 like calling someone who is in, like, like in, in during the Holocaust to take statements from them. It's unbelievable. Like people are running in the streets with blood and bullets and bombings and displacements and starvation. And um, we try to reach them on their phones um, to to ask them about updates and what's going on in their lives. It's 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 unbelievable. Uh, you know, and and this comes from someone like me who lived through multiple wars. You know, I was born in Baghdad. Uh, I've lived in Iraq during the 1990s. I was there during uh, shock and awe in 2003. I also have seen bombs and death and destruction and war. Uh, but what uh, people are witnessing in Gaza, something that we haven't seen in our lifetime, uh, David. It's, it's very, very awful. And the, the worst part of it is that we haven't seen the worst of it yet. Uh, every day is worse than the day before. Every day, the Netanyahu government in Israel feels more empowered uh, and they attack more countries and they kill more people uh, and they, uh, you know, increase the intensity of their war crimes in Gaza. It, it, it seems to me that during the original Nakba, probably many more people than now managed to remain unaware of what was happening. Uh, whereas now it's it's harder to avoid. A lot more people know it's happening, uh, and yet it continues to happen. Um, are, are, is the are the stories that you're hearing and telling getting out? Are are enough people seeing and hearing what is going on? And I think so. Listen, I think everyone knows what's going on. Uh, it's no secret. Uh, we see it on our screens. We wake up and go to sleep uh, watching pictures of dead Palestinian babies, uh, of more Israeli bombardment with our weapons that are fund funded uh, with our tax dollars being dropped on hospitals, uh, on civilian buildings. Um, uh, we watch news of our own government here in the U.S., continuing to send weapons to Israel, uh, despite the fact that uh, doing so violates our own laws. You know, back in the day, me and you, David, used to talk, uh, you know, about U.S. government's violation of international law during the, you know, the 2003 war, uh, during the U.S. occupation of Iraq, uh, about how we're violating international norms. Of course, this government, the Biden administration, has violated all of international norms, and that's out of the window. But now they're very deep into another zone of violating our own laws, violating the national, the the Foreign Assistance Act, violating the Leahy laws, violating Amendment uh, Section 620I of the FAA. 
violating our own laws, breaking U.S. law to accommodate a foreign government to continue committing its genocide, uh, even though those decisions have been so costly for the Biden administration, so costly for the country, for costly for the U.S. governments standing around the world. It literally ended the Biden administration's bid for, a, for for staying in the White House. It literally ended the Democrats' bid to take control over the Senate and House. And they're still, to date, refusing to um, do the right thing, which is stop funding and aiding and supporting genocide that's going on in Palestine. So it's unbelievable. Like, I don't think there is lack of information. Like, when we see the reports coming out, for example, about Secretary Blinken, uh, it's not like he doesn't know. He orders, uh, a, you know, multi-agency assessment uh, based on a congressional mandate that has been turned into a national uh, security memorandum, NSM 20. Uh, you know, Senator Van, Van Hollen wanted to do something about uh, cutting aid to Israel because Israel is violating se Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act, which mandates the United States to not fund foreign security and you know armies in case they're blocking US funded humanitarian aid. Now is Israel blocking US funded humanitarian aid, all humanitarian aid? Yes, they are. That's a fact. No one disagrees. No one disagrees. All the human rights organizations, the United Nations, UN agencies come back to Secretary Blinken and they say, yes, Israel is actually violating our law. They are blocking my food. Our own agencies. He disregards what they say, <laughs> and he continues to fund Israel. Like it's unbelievable. There is no lack of information here. There is no controversy here. It's not that sometimes people are thinking, "Oh, is there a genocide going on in Gaza? Is there not a genocide going on in Gaza? Is Israel committing war crimes? Is Israel not commit? That's not going on. There is a consensus among all actors who actually, you know, can make determination about these issues." including our own agencies in the U.S. government, they're saying there is something unbelievable, something extraordinary going on in Gaza, violations that we haven't never seen before. And this administration continues to send their, uh, to send our weapons, continues their blind check policy to Israel. I mean, the fact that they don't care whether the U.S. aid gets there is somewhat clear from the absurdity of pretending to send aid to a place where you're sending the weapons that are creating the need for the aid in the first place. Uh, but it does seem like even U.S. popular opinion in the polling is on the right side on this. If if, if it were a democracy, this word you hear so much about and people could vote, they would vote to end the weapons shipments. Uh but it's not turned into activism. It's as if people can understand still what's needed, but don't understand that they can do anything about it. Uh, where is where is the the activism? Listen, I think like we have seen the limits of activism and self expression in the U.S. Because you know, me and you and millions of other Americans. Uh, participated in protests in the first few, few weeks and months of the genocide. People flew to D.C. and we contacted our members of Congress and we called the administration and we um, organized and we did things on the state level and on our cities and protested on ports and went to arms industries and uh, filed lawsuits. There is There is a very, very vibrant all the above kind of approach going on in the U.S. But what are the results? Nothing. Because this administration has disregarded U.S. public opinion. They have disregarded their own base in the U.S. So talk about democracy, you know. I mean, we have a very broken democracy. But even with the broken democracy, this administration has failed to maintain its own base. They, their base has eroded. I mean, what we saw during the elections... Uh, David and you know, like I'm, I'm not a supporter of of Democrats or Republicans. Not, not, it's not new for me, you know. Uh, like since I moved to the U.S., uh, since I started voting as a U.S. citizen almost 20 years ago, uh, I have never voted for a Democrat or a Republican in office. Uh, I always vote for uh, you know third parties personally, you know. 
Uh, and so I'm, I'm not a supporter of, of either of the of the ruling parties in the U.S. But if you look at the actual um, uh, flight out of the Democratic Party that happened this year, it is historic. We're talking about a, a multi generational event that looks like what happened after 9/11, when uh, millions of Arabs and Muslims and um, other communities in the U.S. Uh, fled the Republican Party. Because before 9-11, the majority of Arabs and Muslims and uh, many other minorities, by the way, in the U.S. were Republicans because that was the party of faith, it was the party of family, and many, many of people were there. And, and you know, immediately after 9-11, uh, st statistics showed how at least there was a 20% drop in um, support from the Arab community, from the Muslim community in the U.S., immediate drop uh, shifted to um, you know third parties and Democrats. And now, because of this uh, election, uh, there is definitely a Gaza vote, uh, you know, effect where we saw also uh, somewhere between 20, 25 percent drop from uh, Arab communities, Muslim communities, and progressive anti-genocide uh, communities who said we're not going to vote for this administration uh, who is supporting genocide uh, against Palestinians. And those results have uh, been proven, th you know, one, uh, uh, one poll after the other. It wasn't just about Arabs and Muslims. It was also about other communities. Uh, there was a poll conducted by... Um, YouGov, uh, paid for by uh, a few uh, like Muslim and uh, and Arab organizations, and that poll found that almost twenty percent of Democratic voters in swing states uh, thought about Gaza as one of the top uh, priority issues, and they would not vote for Democrats if there was no ceasefire and arms embargo by the time of the election. So these are very very large numbers, and we saw how. Uh, Democrats lost in every swing state, every swing state. They lost in every swing state. These numbers are very real. You know, the Gaza vote effect was very real. And it's not limited to this election. We're talking about a generational uh, effect here, a failure to accommodate uh, what the base of the Democratic Party wanted them to do. I think Kamala Harris may have won Michigan in the end, but she lost enough of them uh, to lose the thing. And I think all she had to do was say, I will end the weapons. Uh, I, I think Hubert Humphrey, all he had to do That's was right. say, I will end the war, but they won't do right. it. He wouldn't do That's it. Right. That's right. I mean, listen, it was very easy. I think it was a softball for her. It wasn't very, very difficult. She could have come in to say, listen, I'm not Biden. I am a new person and I will end the war. And that's the end of the st story. Uh, she had multiple lifelines thrown at her, including during the uh, DNC when a group of dedicated Democrats uh, tried to get a Palestinian, a Palestinian to speak on stage. I mean, how pathetic of, a, of an ask is that? Like, this is not 1950, you know, it's 2024. And you would think asking for a Palestinian to go on stage is very easy. <laughs> and they drafted the speech and ran it by her and it said nothing useful in it whatsoever that she could have allowed it unless she didn't trust them to stick to their own script, you know? Keep, keep in mind that this is the same, the same convention that invited an Israeli uh, with for, to speak on behalf of the hostages who are uh, you know held there. So I mean, it, this this is it's unbelievable. The failure is unbelievable. I, I speak to some of my Arab and and Palestinian and Muslim friends in the U.S., and some of them were actually shocked. Like they were shocked at how tone deaf this administration is. They sent Bill Clinton to speak to the Arab communities in, in Michigan, in Swing State, Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton goes there and he says, you know, Israel belongs to the Jews because their religion is older than your religion. That's what he says in his speech <laughs> to, the, to the Arab and Palestinian communities in Michigan. Bill Clinton, that was the messenger that they chose. I mean, they were so tone deaf. They are so arrogant. Uh, they refused to actually hear what the base was saying and they lost miserably 
and they still have not learned that their uh, their lesson david they, you know you know why because this administration is still running this country they still have the lame duck period that doesn't end until mid january and they actually can and they should redeem themselves by saying those magical words we're going to push for a ceasefire we're going to push for an arms embargo we're going to push for a un security council sanctions against the rogue genocidal maniac government of Israel. They're not saying any of these things. <laughs> not just push for it, but stop sending weapons. It, most right. of the weapons come from Arms the embargo States. now. If, that happens now. It happens now. Right. Just start complying with U.S. law. I mean, this is another thing that strikes me as incredibly absurd, that the U.S. Congress makes laws. It makes the laws. It's made eight or nine laws that are violated by every weapons shipment. And it's finally, after all these months, going to have a vote and lose it in the Senate on whether they should comply with some of those laws. Right. What? Where is the body? Where is the court or the forum for saying you must comply with existing laws rather than propose to create yet another? Listen, you're, I don't want to, see, to say more than what I should say, but you're describing one of our lead projects for the remainder of the year, uh, which is actually uh, asking that question. Where is the U.S. judicial branch when it comes to enforcing existing U.S. law in the U.S.? Because someone, someone has to sue this government to uh, tell them you have to actually follow our own law, uh, and that is in process. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so this is this is literally one of the core components of lack of transparency and accountability that we're dealing with. We're not asking. Uh, the U.S. government to legislate new laws to prevent the transfer of arms to genocidal maniacs. We have these laws. We have plenty of them. We have the Foreign Assistance Act. We have its amendments. We have the Arms Export Control Act. We have the uh, War, Cri War Crimes Act. We have the, the administration's own policies on transfer of conventional weapons. We have, we have this, we have that, we have this, we have that. Uh, what we need is enforcement of existing U.S. law. And you're right to say that now the Senate will have a failed attempt, but we are supporting, of course, symbolically, uh, to introduce a joint resolution of disapproval, a JRD, to block $20, $22 billion uh, worth of weapons to, to Israel. That's important, and that's an important messaging tool. But we really need don't need new, uh, new legislation. We don't need circus in Congress for uh, the select few to prove to us that they're good guys. We need them uh, to go after the executive branch to actually play an oversight role to make sure that existing law, including the Leahy law, including 620i, including other, other laws that we have, that existing law is actually respected by this government. This government is not respecting our own laws. Exactly right. Um, you know, when I when I complain about the lack of activism, I'm aware that there's been tremendous, wonderful, courageous and creative and strategic activism on this issue more than any other in the United States in the past many months. Uh, but in and I know that the United States is too big and it's too hard for most people to get to Washington. But in normal countries, when you don't get what you want, you escalate, you surround the government and you don't let them operate. You don't just do a demonstration on a Saturday and, and go home, wonderful as that is. You, you escalate and you shut down the government. And we are seeing the thing we were all raised to believe was the very worst thing that, that could ever happen. Open public genocide, proudly and sadistically supported why can't why can't more people not the people who are active i'm not blaming them but the millions and millions who are sitting home watching television going shopping going to basketball games why can't we do more listen this is one of my first experiences as a, a new immigrant to the united states was uh, going to a, a rally a protest rally in washington dc um and uh, people said that they're going to you know, disrupt the government and get arrested. Yeah, I mean, I showed up uh, to see what's going on. And in that rally, um, it was a, a cultural shock for me because uh, people, you know, approached the Capitol building and um, 
there was a line for people who wanted to get arrested and they were escorted very politely by a member of the police telling them to stand in this line and they stood in line and they were arrested one after the other and then they there was a processing table next to it where they were given paperwork and my, my, my mind you know i i was completely shocked because you know like where i come from you either don't protest or or you actually disrupt the status quo like when you go out protesting you're not playing games with uh, with the administration with the administration of the government you're actually disrupting what they're doing um right. so it, it was it was a, a, like a kind of like a, a cultural shock for me so i mean that that is that is a, a question that i ask because i think the perception about the united states is that we do have this like space of protest but it is very performative it's perform it's performative and it has a ceiling uh and the the ceiling is you know you can protest exactly as you're saying you can go out you know blow some steam on the weekend but then go back to uh you know everyday life where you're not disrupting the flow of arms to a genocidal regime that is killing people with our money and that these are the norms that were set uh, by uh, by our government and unfortunately it makes a lot of the activism uh, look very uh, like a, like a, like a circus like a, like a play like a performative act of a self congratulatory act like look at me i'm very cool i'm going to go to the street to declare something but it doesn't really translate into a, a change in um, in what's going to happen next now do I have the magical answer to how that will happen? I don't, but I like what you said about escalation because we have to have escalation tactics. You know, when we go outside, when we, you know, yell and no one listens, there has to be an escalation tactic to say not more, one more dollar uh, in our, uh, you know, from our tax dollars to support genocide, N not one more person killed in, in, in Palestine using our political support and our political cover. But where are, Raya Jarar, where are the other nations that see the United States veto all that is decent and good in the Security Council and know that their governments can bring something up in the General Assembly and can force a vote in the General Assembly and can vote Israel out of the United Nations in that act of voting, can impose an arms embargo to the extent that they get nations to do it, can impose sanctions, uh, can can call for unarmed peacekeepers to be sent to Israel and send them. Uh, where are every single other nation in the world when it comes to trying to use the United Nations uh, to bring peace? I'll give you two, two quick answers. I'm keeping an eye on the time. I know we're, we're getting to the, towards the end of the interview. I, I would say people are, are mad. In the US, they're mad. And the lack of um, action doesn't mean lack of disapproval and doesn't mean uh, lack of anger in the US. And that's the same on the on, on the international stage. And my answer about, about the international stage is to say the, the reason why we haven't seen uh, an, a, a comprehensive and uh, strong international community's response um, is that the United States has been an obstacle in moving forward because the world did meet multiple times and the world did reach a consensus that we need to have a ceasefire. And the United States either obstructed that or did not vote to support it. Uh, the US was the only country in the world uh, who consistently, other than Israel, uh, opposed efforts for a ceasefire and vetoed multiple attempts for a ceasefire in the, in the in UN Security Council. There are attempts, I'm reading uh, news about uh, something imminent about to happen uh, you know, in, no in November in this National Security Council uh, led by Algeria. It has gotten a lot of support for an immediate ceasefire uh, resolution that might actually have chapter seven implications, uh, more binding implications than usual. I have, I'm hearing things from uh, Malaysia uh, planning to, uh, you know, introduce a resolution in the UN General Assembly to kick out Israel from the UN uh, completely. So th there, there is some movement there. And I think, you know, uh, what we're seeing on the world stage, uh, David, are two things. Number one, the US leadership is diminishing. Uh, because everyone who's looking for what the U.S. is doing, they're thinking now, 
what is what is this? How can we have any respect for a country that uh, you know obstructs the flow of international law to support an ongoing genocide? The U.S. leadership is diminishing, and other countries are taking the lead. That's number one. Number two, uh, which I think is the more dangerous part, is that we are seeing a collapse of international order. Uh, like international law is not just failing in Gaza, it is dying in Gaza. And many of these, um, you know, groups around the world, members of the ICC, for example, the ICC has always went after black leaders in Africa. Now, you know, many, many governments in Africa are saying, you know what, if you're not going to go after Israel, we're, like, we're going to withdraw from the, from the, Rome statute, we don't want to be a part of this treaty. We don't want to be a part of your international law that only applies to us. We don't want to be a part of this game anymore. So, so what, what's at stake now, and, and, and this is the, the big banker, what's at stake now is not just ending genocide against Palestinians. What's at stake is actually preserving some form of international law and order, because the core of international law and order, the ICC, the ICJ, the US, uh, the, the UN, you know, core treaties and the standing, they are all being tested. Yes, and the ICJ has done its job, although it's absurdly slow. The ICC, the prosecutor, has asked for arrest warrants and is sitting around waiting month after month. So it's not the prosecutor that's refusing to prosecute a non-African. It's it's the ICC <laughs> in back rooms, and we don't know who's making I mean, it. We, we know some stuff. We know that the prosecutor uh, is under a lot of pressure and threats. Uh, we know that two of the three judges uh, were threatened enough to drop the case for uh, health reasons, for family reasons. Uh, we know that there are, there are documentations. I actually saw at, at length reports in the past few weeks, uh, documentation of ongoing, uh, uh, you know, harassment, intimidation, threats to the ICC that has been coming from both Israel and the United States. Uh, both, by the way, are crimes uh, under the Rome Statute. And you don't have to be a member of the uh, a party to the Rome Statute to, for that to be considered a crime. The United States commits these crimes every day by sanctioning the ICC, by threatening the ICC. You know, senators sending uh, public letters to the president asking him to invoke the Hague Invasion Act and invade the ICC. What kind of a country do we live in? <laughs> as long as they invade next year while NATO is having its meeting there, it'll it'll be okay with me. Um, Rayed Charar, we've got just a minute left. I wish we could go for hours. Can you tell people how to get in touch and follow what you're doing? Yeah, I really encourage people to sign up for our uh, newsletter uh, by going to our website, uh, donmina. Uh, we're also on social media. We have a few big projects coming up in December. Uh, so uh, folks should uh, stay tuned. Very good. Rayed Jarar, thank you very, very much uh, for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.